You're listening to On the Record, the full conversation that we were able to have with Jorge Pabon, the chef de cuisine of Manhattan, located in New York City. If you're in the industry and enjoy the inside perspective, subscribe to your listening platform to be updated on our weekly releases. Let's go on the record with Jorge Pabon. So Jorge is the <laughs> chef de cuisine at Manhattan, my direct supervisor. But before we get into his roles at Manhattan, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today? I went to college. I study uh, philosophy, I study economics, then I graduated. And then I decided to go to culinary school. Uh, I always liked cooking, uh, so started researching culinary schools, uh, decided to go for it. And you went to Institute of Culinary Education? Yeah, I went to uh, ICE, uh, Institute of Culinary Education. Uh, Shout out to ICE, that's where I went, 2014. Yeah, Uh, and then um, after that, just uh, did my externship in in the city, New York City. Uh, after that, I decided I was done with the city and uh, started traveling and moving around. I uh, work in Europe, work in California, came back to the city, left the city again, uh, went back to Europe. Where did um, you work in Europe? I work in uh, Italy. Um, I lived there for a little bit over a year. Uh, I also work in Spain. Um, yeah, and then I, I came back uh, to the city. Um, now I'm in Manhattan. So is there, you know, it, from, for me, it sounds like there's a huge difference between working in the city versus outside of the city. And in the city that we refer to as New York City, yeah. uh, I, I assume the volume is much higher in the city versus coming out to maybe like Westchester, out, yeah, out, out yeah. directly outside the city by 20 minutes where the volume falls off drastically. Is it easier to cook outside of the city than it is pressure-wise? Uh, I think it's more uh, more fun to cook outside the city. Uh, I think my, my experiences uh, cooking in a restaurants outside New York City have been more about, um, about the cuisine, about the mm. location, the ingredients. Uh, it seems a lot more intimate. It allows me to, to pursue you know, that art of cooking. Uh, in the city, is uh, super competitive. Um, you know, uh, you know, keeping the business going, uh, keeping the business healthy, coming up with uh, menus, finding purveyors for the ingredients. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of, a lot more competitive, yeah. I think uh, speaking about competitiveness, it's very evident in the city um, how competitive things are and how quickly things change. Um, one good example of that is the discussions that we have on the line and the discussions that you guys as sous chefs have on the line um, relating to new dishes. Just last night specifically, I heard you guys talking about how we wanted to change the burger from the lamb burger to something else, but keep the same yeah. lamb flavors present and just create a new lamb dish. And that was something on the fly, yeah. something that you guys just came up with on the spot. Yeah, I mean, a lot of those, uh, a lot of those changes. There's uh, many, many factors that that lead to many changes. Uh, maybe we, maybe a purveyor can't provide us anymore with an ingredient, so we have to start thinking about a, a new dish. Uh, maybe the owners of the restaurant have a different vision of, of what the menu should look like, so then that... Uh, and that what, also changes seasonally. Like, exactly. um, for example, our chicken dish over the summer, we used in, um, like a pepper hot sauce. As soon as the peppers went out of season, it was yeah. time to change that dish. Yeah, so that's something uh, that we try to... to to keep in Manhattan, uh, work with the seasons. That's mm-hmm. I think that's something we do very well. Uh, we change the menu with the seasons. We rely a lot on the markets. Um, but then, you know, a lot of the menu changes have also to do with what the owners want or maybe what the executive chef wants or maybe what the guest wants. We we pay a lot a very close attention to guest reviews mm-hmm. and, and that, uh, reflects on, on, on our menu. So since we're talking a little bit more specifically about Manhattan right now, why don't you tell us about your role specifically as Chef de Cuisine of Manhattan? Can we paint Can we paint the picture of Manhattan real quick first for those that are unfamiliar with the, the brand and the actual restaurant location and 
kind of how it's set up. I know most people go into a restaurant, they order food, and it just comes out of thin air out of nowhere from the back. Uh, Manhattan is a little bit differently from my understanding, and maybe you can elaborate on how that setup is. Yeah, so at Manhattan, uh, when you come in for dinner, our kitchen is in the middle of the dining room, so you have a choice to sit either at a table or you can sit at the kitchen counter and watch us work. Um, once you're in the dining room, you order from a three-course prefix menu, so you get a first course, an entree, and a dessert. You have a few options for each from each category. Um, yeah, I mean, I think yeah. that's a good basic so description. Com- completely visible. Yeah. And I know you were saying, uh, Jorge, that the menu changes uh, somewhat frequently. H- how often is the menu actually changing? Uh, I would say every three weeks. Oh, wow. There's, uh, there's some major changes on the menu, yeah. Well, that's, a, that's quite often, I think. Yeah. Huh? Mm-hmm. So yeah. that gave you have a lot of creative freedom then, kind of. Yeah, um, I think uh, all of us uh, in the management team uh, have a lot of creative freedom, a lot of input on the menu. Um, even I, I always try to also extend that to the cooks, you know, mm-hmm. whenever they have an idea for a dish or whatever you know, vision they have, uh, they're welcome to bring that to, to us and and help us create a menu yeah sure and you were you were saying new before i uh, interjected real quick uh you were going to touch on oh so my position is a uh, tornado so as a tornado i'm sort of overseeing my team of line cooks or the team of line cooks that i work with um pre-service just to make sure that everybody's ready to go for service and all their stations are set up properly and stocked properly during service, I am at the pass plating and, again, just trying to ensure a smooth service. Or spoon work. Spoon work. Spoon work. <laughs> spoon work and tweezers. That's, uh, that's what we do. I mean, yeah. not to knock it down like that a little bit. <laughs> we make jokes about it, or we used to make jokes about it at Smokehouse, but that's life now. Um, so while I'm doing my plating work at the pass and supervising our uh, – Chef de Partiz, our line cooks, Jorge is supervising me and also just generally ensuring that service runs smooth from the kitchen side of things. So then now what you do as CDC, really explain the role of CDC to, to those that don't know. Uh, I didn't know. I had to look this up a little bit as yeah. I'm in the front of house. So they were know. they were both convinced that CDC um, stood Center. for <laughs> Center for Disease Control. And I was like, yes, that makes sense. That's exactly what we do. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, CDC is a uh, chef de cuisine of the the kitchen. Uh, the title is mostly uh, based on the traditional French uh, brigade system, mm-hmm. uh, the hierarchy. Uh, Very military-like in the kitchen. Yes, there, huh? yes. Uh, so here in Manhattan, specifically uh, as the chef de cuisine of, of, of the restaurant, um, I would say... In the on the culinary side, I'll be. I am the second in command. Uh, be, above me, we have Chef Jason, who's yeah. the executive chef. Jason is the guy. Yeah. <laughs> so so basically, my role is to work one on one with him, and you know, and to help him manage and and run the restaurant, create menus, uh, hire, uh, and like Anum said, just make sure that service runs smoothly. Not to not to make any jokes too, but if the number one in command goes down for any reason, has to leave the restaurant, that puts the number two to the number yeah. one spot. Exactly. Correct? Yeah. He's, so, he's for sure the guy who's making sure that Chef Jason's vision is getting executed properly on a day to day basis. I think that's a, yeah. probably the best way to put it. Uh, uh, basically, yeah, my role is to execute uh, the executive chef's vision. Yeah. Uh, whenever he's not in the restaurant for whatever reason, you know, he has a day off or he's a uh, at an off-site event or one of those uh, reasons, then yes, I'm 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 the one uh, responsible for <laughs> for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Just, so that's really you must see very close eye to eye with with chef at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, we, our relationship uh, is uh, you know we meet every day, we check in, we go over, you know. You know uh, everything. Everything, yeah, yeah. <laughs> everything. <laughs> so much. Yeah. That's how the uh, the scallop conversation started last night. Over Jason looking at some plates and noticing that we had some plates that were going missing and some plates that were just not being utilized properly. Yeah. yeah. Do you? What do you, s- what do you mean missing? Uh, most likely they were being broken. Oh, okay. yeah. like physical plates. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. 
and they're they're expensive plates, and so he was not too happy about them going missing. <laughs> when we talk about the the trend, the culinary trends, and things that you see in the kitchen, you know, what's one of the biggest culinary trends that we're looking at kind of right now, where maybe some guys are overdoing it? You could walk into any restaurant and find the same thing over and over again, where they're not even trying to push the boundaries anymore. Um, I don't know. I think there's many of those trends. I would say, uh, yeah. I would say a, a tasty menu is, is a trend. You know, uh, I think uh, having a, a chef's counter these days seems like, like that's a definitely trend. very trendy. True. Um, I think uh, here in Manhattan, we try to uh, produce something that's a little bit more authentic. Um, we don't really follow these trends. Uh, we just uh, just cook food. That's it. Good f- yeah. cook good food. That's rule yeah. number one. Are there any are there any trends right now that you're looking at, or you look at and you're like, this is this is silly. I don't know why people are. I would say, I don't know. Nothing comes really uh, to me right now. Well, I would say probably plating styles. Those are things that like I look on Instagram and they're like plating food in a certain way that just seems like very uh, trendy. I don't know. That, that would happen? be what you call spoon work, Justin. The spoon work. Yeah. <laughs> Fancy spoon work is definitely kind like of trendy. Like spirals right or yes. like this yes. technique where you, I don't know, put uh, a puree on the plate and then... Mm-hmm. And then just splatter it. So splatter it, yeah. like things like that. Is there something that you see coming up that could be the, the future trend, steering away from those things that we're you know, seeing all the time? I mean, we opened up Instagram, and we talked about it a little bit last, last week, uh, when you open up Instagram, you see these same plating techniques that you're speaking of with all the puree and the spirals all over the yeah, place. Yeah, yeah. And it's only a matter of time before people go, all these plates look exactly the same. We have to start doing something different. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think uh, I, I think going back to, to that idea of something that just uh, looks authentic, organic, uh, just not, you know, adding too much to it, I guess. So now we know a little bit about what your specific role is. Can you give us a little bit of insight as to what a day in the life of Chef Ori is like? From the moment you walk into the building first, what's t- typically the first thing that someone's going to come uh, to you with? Yeah, you so, give us that good fella shot. You know, <laughs> yeah. one, one shot from the street all the way to the table. Uh, so it's a, it's a very long day, first of all. Uh, what time do you typically get in? Because um, you're there before I am. Yeah, I'm usually there around... I would say 11, you know, 11. I, I go to, I wake up fairly early. I go to the gym and then I, I go to the restaurant. Wait, wait, let's tell everybody what kind of gym you go to because this is kind of interesting. Oh, uh, mixed martial arts. Nice. Oh, man, oh, just nice. started doing MMA. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. As if I, cooking wasn't enough, he goes out there and starts fighting people. So, so I do a little bit of that and then I, I go going to the restaurant. Uh, I could see where you can need to do that, though. That's from, exactly. Like, cooking all night. And I the just first want, like, time you told me about that, I was face. like, this, this makes sense. This is the perfect <laughs> outlet for all that aggression that we build yeah. up during the day. I choke someone. <laughs> yeah. Make them tap. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, basically I go, I walk into the, the building and I, and I immediately check in with the sous chefs uh, that open the restaurant, uh, make sure that I really, all the staff members are, are there. Uh, I go over the menus. That's a, a big one. Make sure that all the ingredients arrive, everything that I ordered the, the night before arrive. Uh, uh, and then I always have a long list of things that that I have to do on that day that I, I try to write the night before. Uh, that is maybe interviews that I have to conduct that day or emails that I have to write or I'm working on a menu. Like uh, right now we're working on the Valentine's menu. Um, it's a good month ahead to get things yeah. going. Yeah. So we know what the menu looks like. We start, we uh, post the menu online, uh, start placing orders, start testing the dishes if we haven't, if we don't, you know, we, if we've never done those dishes. And so our Valentine's menu, I think last year it ran for almost a week. It wasn't just yeah. the day of. It was a few days before and a few days afterwards. Yeah. This this time it's just going to be the one day, the Valentine's Day. Mm. Um, and then and then just looking at the schedule and looking at the teams, we have uh, we have like four or five teams right now. Uh, an events team. We have the, the dinner service team, lunch team. We have the prep team. 
uh, and then just we're uh, expanding a little bit uh, as of now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just uh, building those things. And all of this is done before you even step in the kitchen and start looking yeah, at food. Yeah, yeah. So this is all before service starts, obviously. Mm-hmm. And then I spend my my nights uh, running the pass, doing dinner. Yeah. That's a that's a lot of bodies and overhead too. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like you've got a football team there ready to go. So all many people. It's a, at least at, at least it's a uh, forty forty uh, cooks. Jeez. Yeah. And then we have yeah. the and then we have the management team, which is pretty pretty big as well. <laughs> now we we were talking uh, just a little bit earlier on this, and, and we'll get into it a little bit more later on in the uh, episode here. But this tax that's been being put onto checks to cover some kitchen expenses as well. Just three, what was this three percent well, that we're starting to see pop up in various receipts? I don't, I don't want to call it a tax, but you're referring to like a revenue sharing like kind of deal where a new charge is being put on the, put on the bill to cover, you know, the guys in the kitchen who often get shorted on the gratuity scale from the servers. Yeah, so there's a bit of a wage gap between the front house workers and the back house workers, and it's not such a hard argument sometimes to say that back house workers maybe put in more hours or more effort over the course of the day, but totally. those efforts aren't necessarily always reflected in um, their pay. Scale. Yeah, and so um, having a gratuity included or hospitality included or a revenue share program kind of closes that gap a little bit. And that's one of the things that we do at Manhattan. That was one of the reasons why I was eager to join the team, just to be a part of a place that was looking or actively looking and trying to solve that problem. Yeah, I mean, I I certainly know from experience uh, how it feels uh, to, you know, how that gap feels. I yeah. mean, I, I work at restaurants where you know the the difference between the the pay between the back of the house and and front of the house was huge yeah uh, but um i like what we're doing on manhara we're definitely trying to close that 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 gap um and the more the restaurant uh you know the bigger the restaurant gets and the the healthy the business is the the better w- Everybody does. Yeah, everybody does. So to go into it briefly, um, what we do at Manhattan, there's a percentage that comes off of the revenue that the restaurant makes that gets divvied up between the employees, and that percentage is also divided based on the position of the employee, um, exactly, their position yeah. in the restaurant, and their position, their level in that within that position. Yeah. So for a line cook, there's three levels or three tiers worth of revenue share that you could be making, and I think that's same three tiers based on all of the positions within the restaurant. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, you have a base uh, salary, hourly salary, and then uh, a percentage of the, the revenue sales of the restaurant uh, is uh, given to you depending on what station or what position you have. And then as you grow in the restaurant, then your, your salary increases. Yeah. And you, you, I'm sorry. Do you see that, like, because the guys in the kitchen are are getting a little more share of the pie. You see them like taking a little more like ownership over like a dish or being a little more careful or I mean know, yeah, that, certainly. You know? I, I I definitely encourage them to 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 want more to yeah. I I and definitely uh I definitely try to work one on one with all of my cooks to to encourage them to to push for more because as they grow they'll they'll get paid more. Right. So I always uh, make sure that I know where they all want to end up. Someone wants to be a sous chef, someone wants to work the meat station, and I work closely with them to get them to that to that position uh, because obviously they'll learn more and obviously they'll just uh, get paid more as well. Do you, th- do you think that, because we'll, we speak a lot about the crazy like differences in viewpoint between the back of house and the front house right like you have uh you have like the black and white as a black the back of house you walk in it's either it's like this or that and you need a question yeah. you get to the front of house and there's all kinds of drama and stories and like you know this all oh, but this guy needs this and all of a sudden like all have, the stories that the service come up to at the past yeah, it's like you, just all of a sudden there's like this gray right and that you come in the back and you're just like i just need to know 
what you need from my yep. life right now. And then yeah. I need you to go back to the front, right? Do you, and sometimes I think it's lost because obviously there's viewpoints for a reason. Like the front house is a different animal than the back house is. And when you're stuck in the back all the time, maybe you don't see everything out that the front's doing yeah. and vice versa. Like the front's in the front all the time and they don't see everything the back's doing. When you have like a revenue sharing and you understand like it's not just about I'm going to, you know, whatever your responsibility is to dumb it down. I'm going to cook what I have to cook. I'm going to put on a plate. I'm going to send it out to the front. And I don't care what happens after that because I'm done. When you're when you're in a revenue sharing program, now I think does that make people care what happens after the plate leaves? Because you understand that the front of house is going to affect yeah. your bottom line as well. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you want everybody to be as well informed and just ready to deliver the proper product that we're trying to give. So, so your money doesn't get affected basically. And, um, the way we have, we have this nice little revenue share calculator that gets emailed to us so we can see how much we're making in terms of the revenue share on a week to week basis. But you can also kind of get an idea of what the other positions are making too. Like you don't know all of their exact information, but you can like see the numbers and say like, all right, our servers are making this percentage. We're making this percentage. Let's make sure that they're doing their job properly, not to get on their case or anything, but let's make sure they have all the information they need to do their job properly. So we all win at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also the fact that we have an open kitchen. Yeah. Uh, we, we are, we, it feels that we are, uh, out there as well. And we see, you know, we see the food, uh, how it gets presented to the table. How it's received at the table. How it's received at the table. So it feels like we're, we're like constantly, uh, we're part of the entire process. Yeah. So even though we're in the back of the, back of the house, we're in the kitchen cooking. And also for the front of the house, they see us work every night. They see uh, what it takes for us to... And I think that's helpful for them yeah. because then they're able to go and relay that to the tables a little bit better because they're actually watching it go down themselves. Yeah, I do, I do like the term uh, heart of the house. A lot of times you, you hear that maybe referring to the back of the house just because it is like the bloodline. It, you can't do anything without the back of the house. Yeah. Uh, but in Manhattan, from what you said a little bit earlier, the back house is actually the center of the house. It's in the front of the house. <laughs> which <laughs> which house, led yeah. me to think about that heart of the house. That's kind of cool. I like that. Uh, but yeah, once service sense. starts, we're no longer back of the house. We're front of the house at that point. Yeah, and then and we're we're a big part of the what happens at the tables. Uh, servers are always uh, approaching the past and yeah. and, and uh, discussing you know, the, the guest preferences or many alterations. And then it's, uh, they're always having that conversation with us. So mm -hmm. it's almost as if we're speaking with the guest. Uh, so I think, uh, having an open kitchen and being a revenue share restaurant, uh, gives the back of the house at Manhattan a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of power or presence. A lot more opportunity. Yeah. It's, uh, and, me being a front of the house guy and having understanding of trying to communicate to the back of the house a lot of times and all the restaurants worked, I see so many times that a young server, they make a mistake, they panic, they try to go to the back of the house to explain their situation walking on eggshells. But what I'm alluding to is in the back of the house, something's either made right or wrong. There's no gray area. I think we talked about that a little bit uh, last week. And there's no gray area in the front of the house. There's so much gray area because every situation is different and it could be treated in about 15 different ways or so to get to the right, the right conclusion. I mean, do you, now you're in a profit sharing environment where maybe it's easier for you to understand what's going on with the server and the server is a little bit easier to come back to you and say, Hey, this was a mistake. Can we fix it this way? Instead of saying, well, she kind of ordered this and ordered that. <laughs> Just get to the point. I want to fix the problem. Right. I mean, uh, that still happens. Yeah. Um, but yes, uh, there's, uh, um, I mean, I, I can definitely see how the servers are, st they, they come from different restaurants, so they come from that background. So they definitely still feel a little bit, uh, intimidated, intimidated yeah. when they approach the kitchen and, you know, when, or when they make a mistake as well. But, um, I think because we are, part of the of the whole process and and we definitely you know need them uh i think we're we're really good at uh, communicating with them and yeah. understanding also like i i stand there all night and i see service and you know like you said before 
working in kitchens where the kitchen is in the back. I don't see what goes on during service. Right. I'm super detached. I just cook and send the food. I don't know what happens. A lot can get that. lost in translation like, on both ends. But here in Manhara, I see the interactions. I, I see the, the challenges that the servers uh, have every night. Um, so, so it has made me a lot better at communicating with them and understanding uh, sure. where they're coming from and, and being there uh, as a you know, support for them and the kitchen. Being, uh, being on center stage as well, too, where everyone can see every single action that you do, uh, a, a lot of times you have to be aware that people are watching you. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's, there's many times where I just want to reach over the path and, like, you know, choke someone. Or <laughs> but you can't <laughs> use, do that use, because use just my as mixed easy. martial arts. Skills, yeah. But no, just, no, I can't. Yeah. Well, so things like sanitary things, too, where guys are always touching their face or their yeah. hair or something where you have to be conscious of this. Uh, you know, you watch a bartender stand behind the bar biting at their fingernails or something con- consistently. And, like, it's not something that's acceptable. But here you are in the center of the house, literally, where everyone can see you. You have to be very mindful of everything that you do. Yeah, I think uh, I think that definitely makes... Uh, I think that's a good thing that we are in that position um, because it also makes us much more aware of... Um, of our cooking, you know, where I think our movements are more delicate, more, you know, we're more, we're, it makes the cooks uh, more conscious of, of what they're doing and they try to be extra careful. And I think that in the end makes the, the food be that much more uh, perfect. Mm. I know for sure since I've been working there, I've gotten a lot more aware of the sounds that you make when you're doing everything, the way you put something down, the way you pick something up, the way you grab a saute pan and the way you saute stuff. Like, um, I know at Smokehouse, you know, it was always cool if you saw a little flames in the pan. Like, you don't do that at Manana because <laughs> everybody's watching. Everybody's sitting there yeah. like three or four feet away from where you're working. Like, you, you want to make it look as tight as possible. You want to look as professional as possible at all times. Yeah, your movements, your interactions with your with the other cooks. Yeah. Um, yeah, everything is uh, a little you're, bit more. You're on stage uh, performing refined, for people. Yeah. How often, and I see all the time when I open up Craigslist too, uh, I see that the restaurant's always hiring. Is I also see that a lot of restaurants run into these problems where maybe one of the employees starts showing up a little bit later and then a little bit later again, and then a little bit later again, and all of a sudden they don't show up anymore. But the restaurant goes, shit, we don't have somebody else. Now we have to start hiring. Uh, When you guys are hiring nonstop, is this one of those preventative measures, or is it a turnover situation? No, um, we're actually hiring so much because the restaurant just keeps expanding, keeps growing. Uh, It's just nonstop. Uh, that's, uh, That's the main reason. Um, I don't, like I think uh, hiring and and it's a it's an area where I I have a lot to say uh, because I'm very close to the process now in in mm-hmm. my role um, I'm the person reaching out to cooks I'm the person con- uh, conducting the interviews I'm setting up their trails I'm uh, I'm hiring them I'm having the conversation about salaries where they're going uh, and then. You know, I I started a, as a cook as well, and and I travel and I did a bunch of trails. I work for free a lot, um, so I know I know the challenges of of being a cook, mm. uh, the challenges of having a, a goal and 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 you know a dream and what to do and and needing a mentor in the whole process. So um, we hire. Because we definitely need people. The restaurant is growing. Uh, the level of uh, refinement that we want to achieve in, in, in our cuisine requires perhaps a little more extra hands sometimes. Um, and also, we want to create a, a, a system where, where cooks can go through the process uh, in a in a slow way, they they come in, they are a commie, they learn about the ingredients, how to how to treat the ingredients, how to clean them, and then from then they move on to 
the line, the hotline, and they go through all the 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 stations. And then hopefully they stay with us long enough that they can become a manager. Uh, I also am very aware that Manhara is part of this huge restaurant group. Mm -hmm. And if we, if I can like help them get to a position where to grow to the to a point where they can like move on to another one of the locations and be a manager at another restaurant, then I think that's something that we should do. I mean, we definitely have the resources and the space. So if we can create, if I, if, you know, if I can create a system where it feels like a culinary school for them, sure. Then I, that's I'm all about it. And every job in this business should be schooling at the end of the day. Absolutely, because you I never I, know everything. I think to me, that's the now being in this role. I feel like that's uh, probably the the thing I'm most passionate about, uh, the teaching aspect of it. And and I know, wow! I mean, this restaurant is so huge, has so many resources. This is a great opportunity to create a system where where it feels like like a culinary school. Um, it's very challenging because at the end of the day, it's not a culinary school; it's a business, and you have guests coming in and expecting. Uh, so, but then that makes me realize then then the training that these cooks need to go through has to be, you know, top notch. So that sure. they, so that the, the you know they are getting an education, but at the same time they, they are meeting the guest expectations. How many covers do you wind up doing average in a night at Manhattan? It's, I, it, I don't I don't think we ever really know because yeah. we we have the dining room and we I would say on average it's always fluctuates between I don't know one ninety to two hundred and twenty, but then that's never counting the bar. And the bar or the, is uh, or the lounge. You can or the lounge, and, lounge. And, and the bar and the lounge uh, get uh, really crazy. So yeah. So you you mentioned starting right back from the beginning of that whole process, bringing somebody in for a trail, right? So you got a prospective cook comes in, he's gonna work with you guys for a night. And you're kind of feeling each other out, right? It's kind well, of not just a night. They'll come in like eleven o'clock in the morning and work maybe a lunch shift, and then they'll do a little bit of prep, and then they'll come out for so dinner shift. So they're giving they're a whole there. day. Yeah, yeah the whole day. full day. So. What are you, what do you, when you invite someone in for a trail, what are you looking for in that person? I, when I bring someone in for a trail, I think the, the thing I'm looking for the most is their drive, um, and their eagerness and, and how excited they seem, uh, about just cooking. You know, if they, if they have a lot of questions about, the cuisine about the stations. Uh, I think I think that's pretty much it. I I think we definitely have a in. It's a big enough place that you can start from the very beginning if you don't have any experience, and work your way to the to the top. Um, the so, thing, the so things yes. I've noticed um, when we have people in for trails, there's like two distinctly different types of people. There's the type of person who wants to come in and just do as much as possible. And then there's another type of person who will come in and they're comfortable and they're willing to just stand around and watch you guys work and learn from you. But it's the guy who wants to come in and just start working and like pick up a station and work that station for the entire day. That's the guy that ends up not necessarily starting as a comedian, but that's someone who will end up maybe with a line spot as soon as they yeah. get hired. And there's nothing wrong with either type of those person, but it shows two distinct levels of drive. Yeah. Sure. I mean, it's a it's a very intimidating uh, space. Uh, I definitely see a lot of trails coming in and and just kind of staying to themselves. And and there's so much going on so that they don't really shine. Uh, and then, but then you see other trails that come in and just quickly jump in and you know work work a station, talk yeah. to the cooks, talk to the chefs. They feel like... Like comfortable. Yeah, it's very comfortable. And yeah. so those are primarily the the trails that we probably, you know, most most likely end up hiring. Were you observing Anum on his trail? <laughs> I think you were there the day I trailed, but I was hanging out mostly with Rose that day. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, I mean, most of the time, yes, I, I schedule everyone uh, around 11.30 so they can see a little bit of lunch, which is a little bit more um, friendly. <laughs> and then, a little easier, a little more easygoing. A little more easygoing. They arrive, you know, 
quite early and and they do a long shift and then uh and then they they they're there when the pm team starts arriving uh and then i assign the person to to someone to work with and then they do a little bit of dinner um so they they get to experience a whole day in uh, at manjara and then it gives us a chance to to see them yeah uh, to see how they're going to react yeah. to it all you should uh, at the end of their trail i always take like a good half hour to an hour to talk to them uh, ask them how they felt uh, where they're coming from are they trailing anywhere else what are they looking for and and then we take it from there. So the trail is essentially like a free trial run, mm-hmm. almost. It's you like a it's a working interview. Yeah, working for for, interview. for both for for the trail and and for us. Gotcha. Which I guess is similar in the bar too. You want to test a kid out, you bring him in as a guest, yeah. you throw him a couple bucks. Thanks. You brought some people in, hopefully. And if you're terrible, you're not getting invited back. It's, yeah, it's a two <laughs> exactly. way. It's a two way thing. Yeah. They get to see you, and you get to see them. Which I, which I'm wondering is there any way that trail that you actually really liked that uh like declined and decided that oh yeah it yeah. happens de- all the time definitely yeah. i i've had many trails that come in and i'm i'm, I'm like absolutely want this person and they, they, just they never can come be, back they can be great for the team uh they interacted with the team every everyone from the team comes to tell me hey hire that person they were great today um but yeah ultimately sometimes they end up going somewhere else There's also like a, I think there's a piece of age and the more experience that you get when you're a kid, you're 15, 16, 17, entering into this business, you're just happy to get anything. Like, let's just work somewhere. Who's going to hire me? As you get older, the interviews you do realize start going both ways. They're Mm -hmm. not just, I'm getting interviewed by this manager to see if I get this job. Is this job the place where I want to work? Yeah, you, know? you got to decide exactly. if this is somewhere you want to go every day and spend your whole day there, and like doing hard work sometimes. Completely. Like it's it's not an easy job if you don't really want to be there. Completely. I, I feel I feel the same way. Like when I'm interviewing people, like I'm always thinking about how I want to present myself and our restaurant to the person that's applying because it's not just you know trying to fill a spot. It's like right. It's their first impression. So if you're walking in and then I end up or we end up hiring that person, they already have their first impression from the interview. So it's important to like go Make yourself ways. look good, yeah. Yeah, no, and, and I, I st- we certainly have a, like an SOP on, on how to uh, welcome a trail and how their day is gonna go. I, I definitely have a plan for them. Also, specifically to maybe uh, they're coming in for a specific position. So we already have like a little plan of how their day is going to go um, just because of that, because I, I want to have them feel that this is the right place for them. And SOP is a something operating procedure, I assume? Yeah. Standard. 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 How come I can't get that word? <laughs> Welcome to the club, Jay. Yep. Uh, you know, there's a... That's not kitchen terminology. That's just no. That's just life. You know, life. <laughs> and now I know. <laughs> is there? And this is a little bit going left here. The, the question that you really want to ask Jorge is, what mod grinds his gears? <laughs> yeah. Is there any uh, any modifiers or questions, comments that we get on a regular basis. Well, set that, set just, that up a little bit though. Like, you know, <laughs> like you have this whole menu and everything that you just, yeah. For example, about. for example, I think, right. um, at least once last week we had a ticket come in that was labels as a shellfish allergy, but the guest for sure ordered a lobster. <laughs> um, actually I, I definitely enjoy, uh, working with many alterations. I, I really do. I think at Man- doing that at Manhattan is, very challenging because of how busy service is and you don't I don't always have the time uh to to just you know take my time to just cook for one guest um so that's what makes it challenging that's what makes it a little bit sometimes makes me feel like I wish I you know I wasn't dealing with this particular alteration but I I definitely love uh, having these conversations, uh, uh, a vegan person comes in. I definitely love to put something together for them, or someone with like, can eat this, can eat that, or someone that is like wishing for, hey, I, I, you guys have pasta on the menu, but I want a different pasta. Like, I definitely love doing that. I think that that's how my creative process works, just like on the spot, putting things together. 
Um, but having said that, the the one alteration that I, I really dislike is when guests uh, kind of pick an item from one dish and then they want to add that to another dish. Like let's say you have a chicken and then you have, a I don't know, the steak with whatever else. Then they'll say, I'll have the chicken, but I'll have the, the side that comes with the steak. And then I'll have the sauce that comes with that those those uh, alterations I really always try to you mean discourage making, the the server from uh, agreeing to making a new dish. You mean? Yeah, it's yeah. like that because it makes me feel like they're just playing <laughs> chef that they're not here to enjoy to have our, what we're like yeah, providing for them. Our, our food. Yeah. Yes, yeah, like I just mentioned before, you put in all this effort of like yeah. creating a dish and the menu the way you want to display it to somebody, and then they're like, "Yeah, no, nah, but I want. I'm just gonna do my own thing." Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. I definitely. Well, what you just said was very hospitable at the end of the day, is you enjoy these mods coming in. It's not like you're going, shit, you know, what's this person doing? What do they think they're doing? You say, I'm going to adhere to, you know, whatever these mods are. Yeah. I'm going to make it work, even though it's busy as hell. We're doing 200 covers plus some. Yeah. No, I, I definitely, definitely enjoy that a lot. Uh, someone comes into the past and says, hey, this person wants a cheese plate. Uh, and we don't have a cheese plate on the menu. I love to just, like... Go to the we, run, the run to the back, yeah. grab all the cheeses that we have, and make like a beautiful uh, cheese, nice. cheese plate for them. Or, or maybe we have a a table that you know we're all friends with, and and, and we do this very often. That's always like, that's uh, always fun. Whenever from the industry or someone that's friends from yeah, whenever uh, friends our friend come in, or, you get or a to... family member, we just say hey, we just tell the server hey just tell this person that we'll cook for them. And then we just write a menu. And, and yeah. usually it's a menu that's not on the menu. So we're like just coming up with dishes on the spot. That's that's my favorite. Like I've been to a couple of restaurants where either my I knew the chef or a friend of mine knew the chef. And we just sit down and serve us menus. And we're like, nope, just tell chef whoever, you know, we're sitting at we're yeah. sitting at table, send yeah. us whatever they, whatever they want us to eat. And a couple of times I've done that was like literally the best meal I've ever had. Totally. Yeah. He's and real and good at that. There was, um, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, one of our truffle guys came in and you put together that steak and lobster spread for him. Oh, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> that looks so good. Uh, and also, those are the times where I have the most fun yeah. doing service as well. It's like, because service is, is very, it's very hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's a brutal six hours sometimes. Uh, and so if I have the chance during that night to like cook for someone uh, a special dish or or do something different for them and I can just like kind of like zone off, uh, zone out from, from service and just like concentrate on this one dish and like spend that time doing that, that's, those are the, the best nights for me. And also again with those, um, the modifications too, uh, a lot of the times the stuff that we'll end up making for somebody with some special dietary needs, it comes out really good. Like there was a couple of times last week, John had to make a couple of, uh, like vegan pastas. We got to throw the squash puree in there, some fresh vegetables. It was really delicious and, pasta. And it also feels really good to know that a lot of these uh, guests that we, ha we, we have come in with dietary restrictions are legit dietary restrictions. Yeah. Um, and it feels really nice that they, you know, had the had something really nice, you know, uh, not that just they're not a, just getting like some salad on a yeah. plate because they can't eat whatever else we have, you know. Yeah. So it's so it's nice to to be able to create something that they can't cook at home or they probably never had before, and and to have them feel that they can come to this place and and enjoy a meal that they probably haven't had in in a long time. That that feels really good. But you alluded to sometimes somebody would order a lobster, would have a yeah, shellfish that. allergy. Can you, what? I mean, we, we have a lot there of There had to be a communication we, we breakdown have the, there. We have a, a lot of tickets that say gluten-free, but then the person is eating bread at the table. Yeah. or And then they just like modify the dish in a way that feels annoying because you see them eating that same, uh, the same know, item support, somewhere else somewhere or somehow else. else. So, all that really means is they just <laughs> didn't want to say that they didn't want it, so they're going to call it an allergy or something yeah. like that. But. So yeah, we, we have a lot of that. Yeah. And that's a, that's a whole topic in itself, too, is <laughs> where you know, some of these allergies can kill somebody, but then you have Betty and Sue on the other side. They're like, I have a nut allergy just because they don't like nuts. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so you're talking about being able to work with things in a special way sometimes. What's one ingredient that you get the most excited to see that you get to work with on a daily basis? I mean, really just working with the market in general, like 
the fact that we get a lot of uh, produce from the market, directly from the market, and knowing which farms they come from, uh, it's it's really something I enjoy a lot. And, and working with the seasons, knowing this whole concept of time and place, uh, knowing what season it is, because uh, I'm eating asparagus, so mm-hmm. I know what season it is. Uh, and then changing the menu with the seasons is really what I like about cooking. So you and I were talking about it yesterday. If you want to just quickly describe our market program and uh, Ian, shout out to Ian who yeah. kind of runs our market program a little bit. You want to tell him how that works? Yeah, so we have uh, this uh, employee, uh, Ian, uh, great guy. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful guy. We'll, we'll uh, discuss him off mic later. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, he's uh, in charge with making trips to the market uh, four times a week and just uh, gathering everything that we we order uh, and bringing it back to the restaurant. He's one of the first eyes on quality. So at the end of the night, the cooks will make a list of all the produce and other items that they need from the market. It's Union Square Market he goes yeah, to. Yeah, Union Square Market. Yeah, and so then you know get there bright and early in the morning, load up the truck with everything that we have on the list, bring it back to the restaurant distribute it out to everybody and those are our fresh produce that we work with for that day and maybe the next day before it goes back to the market they're really just going to restaurant depot though right no union square market my man yeah. gets up and goes to the market yeah. he yeah. speaks to everybody and gets the name of the farm so when we get like a a case of zucchini or something like that it'll say norwich meadows farm zucchini on it so we know exactly where it's coming from and we can keep and that, an eye on and that that's quality also part of the reason why our menu changes so often is because we're such a busy restaurant and it's also it's sometimes hard to rely on uh, on on the market or a specific farm for for an ingredient uh, for so long. So maybe we can get carrots from this farm, but we sell so much of it that maybe we can only you know maybe in two three weeks we just can the the farm can't keep up. So we change the dish, mm. and we rather than change the dish than then order ingredients some like subpar carrots or something like that so is that part of a philosophy at manhattan of like what you're using versus like yeah that is definitely very attached to to the cuisine and and the experience that we want to offer the guests for sure uh having uh having all these uh amazing ingredients available yeah so what happens but you know let's do a scenario right because this is always the tough thing when you 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 lock yourself, or no, I don't want to say lock yourself, but if you have a certain philosophy that you're trying to work through, right? And you, like you said, you get it from a farm or wherever your distributor or your purveyor is that you get it. You're in a certain menu, though, and, like, something happens. You don't get a product that you need for the night. I mean, do you just scratch so the item or are you, you forced to, like, run we're somewhere? We're forced to call an audible. So at 2.45 every day when the PM team gets there, we have a menu meeting. So the cooks have 45 minutes before that meeting to go around to all the various walk-ins and check their mise en place, all the ingredients that they have for that night. If there's something that they don't have, we'll discuss it in the meeting and figure out a way around it. We also have the luxury of printing our own menus. So if we do need to make a change, we so can just... So you can change it day off. Yeah. 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 So yeah. yeah, that's something that happens every day. And, <laughs> Literally and, every day. Uh, yeah, and very often we end up having to make many alterations because because yeah because maybe an ingredient didn't arrive or we or, don't have enough of it for the night we don't have enough of it for the night so we just have to kind of change the dish a little bit or or take take the dish off the menu yeah how but quick it, is your turnaround how quick is your turnaround from like one menu to another just get into that because you said you got like a new menu every three weeks or so well, it's so like not a f- completely new menu but maybe okay so it's just dish. one thing yeah, yeah here and there yeah so like yeah. how quick do you are you just always running through ideas of like all right, we got this on the menu and we swap, you know, one item out for a new thing and then you're like on to the next thing tomorrow. Yeah, that's pretty much how it works. Uh, we we think of a new dish. We find where we want to put that dish on the menu. Uh, once that change happens, we're on to the next uh, item that we want to change and work. I, uh, two days ago, we had yep. two new items uh, go live on the menu. And then last night I was having a, a discussion with, with the chef about the next the next changes. Yeah. Is is there a day of the week that you shoot for to like introduce new items or it's just like it's ready, let's go? Yeah. I think it's it's, it's ready, more let's like go. That. I mean I always try to plan it and, and have specific days where I know this is the day that I have maybe more time to to work on a dish or I know which sous chef has more time to work on a dish on a particular day. Uh, and then we always try to make 
those dishes go live on specific days of the week. Uh, but it rarely works works out like that. It's usually, you know, we don't want to order more of this item. We're running low on this item. We'll just run it out and go into the new dish. How, how do you decide when it's time to, like, kill something on the menu? Like, it's just not working out or... It's usually because uh, seasons are changing or that ingredient is not going to be available uh, any longer. Have you ever had something just bomb completely? Mm. Or are you mm. like, everybody loved the dish and then it just fell flat on its face? I don't I don't recall. I don't know about that. Oh, you guys are undefeated. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you have any advice before we let you go here to new chefs coming in? Whoa. Um... I mean, yes, I tons of advice, uh, but it's hard to, I mean, everyone has different goals and uh, different uh, aspirations. They came from different backgrounds. So I think I, I try to include all of that in, in, my, in my advice. I mean, I certainly my, my own path to here uh, was you know, a lot of traveling, a lot of uh, figuring out things on my own. Um, but I, I guess one of, if I have to say, you know, one thing, it would just be just be patient. You know, cook, cooking is fun. <laughs> cooking is fun. Cooking is fun. <laughs> um, I, I, I would really just would like would say find find a mentor. I think that helps a lot. I think when you have someone who can like um, mentor you uh really really you know really helps uh also try to figure out what where you want to go early on that way every decision you make feels like you're going on 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 a path that makes sense you're not zigzagging too much yeah not like wasting time zigzagging yeah but have uh, a goal in mind have a goal yeah have a goal in mind stick to it uh it's not gonna be easy but there's uh just keep going i love it Ju- uh, justin's breathing into the <laughs> microphone in case you're wondering why i'm looking around lost i'm trying to figure out who's doing it i thought that said stop blasting into the microphone breathe. you have you have bad breathe. handwriting jay was freaking out for a little while i'm like i'm that very says breathing yeah. i'm <laughs> I'm very sensitive in the ears. Okay. I thought you said you couldn't hear. You says, started stop, today. I was saying, oh, I can't hear. Stop brushing I'm into microphone. That's no, but uh, you know, or I think finding a mentor <laughs> mentor is quite important. I, I think. I think it's how you advance. I think in this industry, it's you kind of very very it. important. Yeah. I, it's just there's so many you know so many restaurants. You can do this anywhere in the world. Absolutely. Um, and I think having someone who who's older, who's done it, uh. You know, checking in with you, see where you're at, see, you know, discuss what your goals are. Kind of keeps you from getting lost. Yeah, it kind of keeps you from, exactly, from getting lost. From Just kind of keeps you uh, also, mo- can, can keep you also motivated, inspire you. I think, uh, I think that helps a lot. I don't think when I started, I had like that person. I, I made, uh, you know, I was just like, in search of uh, all these chefs and cuisines and styles, and that's what kept me motivated. Um, but I think having that physical person, I think that uh, is very helpful. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter via waitingonfriespodcast.com. Enjoy the episode. Make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast by hitting the link below.